Summer is upon us. Listen to this. That is the sound of meat on a grill. And today's guest is Chef Darren Leonardson on episode five of The Story That Writes Us. When I first talked to Chef Darren Leonardson about being on this podcast, we were trying to just figure out the logistics of it, seeing if he could find time to come in a little studio space that I have set up at the church and uh, just see if he'd be able to sit down and record with me. And he made a fantastic suggestion. He said, why don't you just come over to my house and I'll just cook us a meal and we can just talk while I cook. And friends, here's a pro tip for you. If a gourmet chef ever offers to just throw something together for you, the answer is always yes. Darren grew up around food and found joy in mixing ingredients together to produce perfect meals. He was the executive chef at a number of restaurants in Seattle, and he even worked for a time at Google. But he wasn't designing software. He managed more than 60 employees and ran the kitchens in five different buildings across Google's campus in Kirkland, Washington. The Seattle Times, in writing about one of the great perks afforded to Google employees, wrote... The chef harvested watercress, goat cheese, strawberry, and toasted almond salad at Google's Kirkland Cafeteria was spectacular. I couldn't resist the roasted lamb with blackberry sauce or the garlic lover's soup with Beecher's white cheddar. That's what Google employees had available to them any time they wanted to go get it. And that's what Google used to lure great engineers in the early days of the company. We started our time together not in his kitchen, but in Darren's backyard. A pergola provides perfect shade over his green egg grill. I can hear the birds chirping perfectly. This is so peaceful. It's like so peaceful. This reminds me, like just the, oh, I think it reminds me of my parents, how they were very much, you know, where where I grew up. um, I call it the Garden of Eden, like, because everyone's like, what inspires you about cooking? And it just reminds me of where I grew up in Washington. And we lived on two and a half acres. And my dad, um, when we first moved there, he planted 40 fruit trees. So everything from plums to apples to pears to cherries. So when most kids would be selling lemonade on the street corner, I was selling my dad's Japanese pears for like a buck a pop. (laughs) And so like just growing up with that and being around nature and food just was so inspiring. So we... um, we had they had an English garden that was, you know, it was probably twice the size of this patio here. So, you know, probably like 30 by 50 feet. And in the center, it had a fountain and everything was like automatic watered. But my mom would go out and we would pick radishes for a fresh salad um, or fresh herbs, you know, and add it to like a vinaigrette dressing. And so like for me, like always wanting to be in that moment and back to that, just like, cause those were just such wonderful, great moments. It like, just gives me like chills on my arm. Like when you have gooseies, it means it's true. Um, and and so I, I can acknowledge for those who are listening, I see chill bumps on your arms as you, t- as you talk about this, it's like a return to Eden almost. It is. Yeah. And, and when I say the garden of Eden too, like, so not only did he plant all that and we had an English garden, but I helped him, um, build a greenhouse. So it was a 30 by 40 foot greenhouse. And in the center of the greenhouse was a grape tree that, that the, I mean, the vine was like, uh, I don't know, like uh, uh, as thick as my body. And the, the, the vine wrapped around the whole greenhouse. And every year we would harvest two garbage can full of, of these wonderful green grapes. And so we had that. And then my mom would start all the baby plants and everything. But then on the, the property, we had an amazing view of the Cascade mountain range. So it was really beautiful, but there was wild mushrooms. So like morel mushrooms literally grew in our forest up, up just in that last little quarter of an acre. Um, then there were blackberries, like crazy blackberries. There were these blackberries that, um, the, there's two types. There's the Himalayan and the evergreen, but those actually came from Japan. So they're prolific in Washington now. They've really taken over. But there's a natural berry that is called the dewberry. And it's a really small, tiny little blackberry that's indigenous to that area. And it grows on the ground. And you have to really kind of search it and try to find it. 
and you know just a bowl of those and it just sort of brings me back i used to put that over my cereal in the morning and it was just incredible like the flavor was so intense um and then they had these black cap raspberries so it was a raspberry but it's a wild raspberry and just intense raspberry flavor in this form of a little raspberry so just that's what we i grew up with like all around that and so like my dad he was an engineer, so he wanted me to go to school and, you know, almost follow in his footsteps to be an electrical engineer or something, something analytical or something like that. And so I think he didn't necessarily understand what being a chef was. I think he associated it with um, back in the day, you're just a cook. And so to, for, for me to kind of go through that transition of becoming a cook to becoming a chef, it was challenging for him, but then when he started to eat the food and experience the experience of food, he really he really started to appreciate it and love it. So, Can't you just tell that this is a guy who absolutely loves food and everything about it? So as we waited for the big green egg to, to get to the proper cooking temperature, he walked me around to the side of his house to his garden. When I moved here 10 years ago, I knew how to grow, f grow food in Texas or in Washington, but not here. Like it's a completely different environment. Just it gets so hot. So I tried to grow, um, you know, vegetables and fruits in the ground and I just could never succeed in it. And so finally I'm like, I'm getting raised beds and I'm going to have set up the, the watering system. And it sort of brought me back to my parents again, right? This is what they did. When I'm pan searing steak, I'll come and, and harvest this fresh thyme. You know, what's great is you can come snip this and you, you like Gordon Ramsay shows that simple way of doing a pan seared steak where you get your pan hot, you sear it really nice on one side, then you flip it, you have a tab of butter, then you add fresh thyme, like a bunch of it. Not just a sprig, like a whole bunch of it so that you get the flavor and then garlic and then you start basting the steak, you know, and it just creates this wonderful aroma and flavor. So I love that I can just come out to the garden and do that. Now, we're gonna snip some because we'll brush some of our steak that we're gonna grill. So I just harvest that. I mean, that just smells so good. You can't beat that. Oh, wow, right? that and smells then, fantastic. Then we're gonna make a citrus um, basil chili vinaigrette dressing to go over our steak salad. You guys, I've even stepped away from you and I can still smell it with the fresh cutting. You smell that, you smell the basil. Oh, that's heavenly. Isn't that amazing? Now, come over here. I've got, I've got these Cherokee purple tomatoes that are ready. And here's oh, something wow. so cool. Like when I see this in nature, like they, I know they can't see it on the screen, but you see this tomato has got this other little piece of tomato. It looks like a nose on yeah. the tomato. It's an heirloom Cherokee cherry tomato, but it actually has incredible flavor. So these, here's some Cherokee purple tomatoes. They're ready to go. I've never seen purple, dark purple tomatoes like that. Yeah, it almost like looks that. like an eggplant. That's it, yeah. Here's a couple right here. Um, but I'm excited about this. We got squash. See some strawberries. Cucumbers. Um, wow. It just makes me happy to have <laughs> vegetables. There's peppermint too. Chewing on peppermint is just so cool. Yeah. Oh, it is. Yeah. It's just amazing. I mean, that is so intense. So, all right, let's go. Um, let's do some cooking. Cooking and talking is so fun. Come on, Frisco. My dog needs to get out of the garden. So our grill is like perfect too. Let's see the nice coals. Yeah. It's like, this is like the best way to cook meat right now. So the sizzle is gonna be amazing. So I got Darren walked coins, me through all the steps um, to like grilling the steaks that would go on top so, of our remarkable uh, salads. A, uh, and uh, honestly, it was kind of enthralling. When you're with someone who's a master of their craft, just watching them work and hearing them explain things, it makes you realize how little you know. And I appreciated so much Darren's attention, not only to the to the flavors that he was mixing in, but also just to the to the look of it and adding some things just for color and making sure the salad was even the right height. His attention to every little detail of the dining experience is what makes him a really great chef. The food, it's it's the, the temperature, it's the sear, the how you marinated it, how you presented it, how quickly did the diner, you know, get the food and cut into it. So you see those wonderful grill marks already? I do you see those wonderful grill marks. I'm gonna photograph those wonderful that's grill marks. The other key. Here, hold hold this bowl for me. Yep. We're gonna go in and now build our little salad. Nice. Doesn't that smell amazing? That meat? Brother. 
<laughs> so we moved on to phase two, which was making this salad. And Darren showed me how to make a balsamic vinaigrette from scratch with the freshest ingredients. And the fun thing about doing this is, you know, he just talks the whole time. He loves food, loves everything about it, and explained every ingredient, why it was being added, what it does to the overall taste and the dining experience. It was quite a treat. But eventually, once the food is made, it's time to eat. And then the last thing is the fresh ground pepper over the top. And now we get to eat together. Oh my gosh. We continue talking. I'm, I'm about to weep. I mean, this is... <laughs> This is beautiful. We need to say grace over this meal. So, um, dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for uh, this incredible experience. Thanks for the glory of this beautiful sunny day. Thank you for reconnecting with Rob and this awesome opportunity to be on his podcast. Lord, I just ask anybody that's on this podcast, Lord, that, that you touch them. If they're hurting in any way, they need you. Give them the courage and the confidence to reach out. Maybe go to church, try something new, connect, ask. Just reach out to you, Lord, and ask and wait and be willing to be patient and try something new. But I also encourage people to, to cook, to cook more. To, to go back to their roots and bring out their passion and try the foods that are indigenous around their area. Go to farmer's markets, uh, be inspired to make different things um, and share it with people. And um, Lord, we just ask this food to be blessed. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. What a great prayer. Thanks. Gosh, I'm excited. That was nice. You want a little napkin? Do you have your water? Uh, I have my water. See, and then what's great about a composed salad is like, you can say, oh, where do I want to start, right? Yeah. Because a toss salad is just kind of like, my thought on that is like, you're just feeding your body, right? Right. It's fuel. But here it's like, you're like, oh, I can try this steak that was grilled. Let me just put one of those little pieces. Yeah. This is a five course meal here instead of one right. dish almost. I'm, exactly. I'm going for the steak first as well. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're the kind of person listening who doesn't like chewing sounds, I apologize in advance because the rest of this podcast... It's going to be us chewing. Oh. oh, you're right. Just that little bit of caramelization. On the steak. On the steak. That's heavenly. Try it with the avocado. So, so for you to like say, I want... Mm -hmm. To ask me about food, yeah. Or you, you know, why did you? Why were you thinking that that you wanted to select me to be on your podcast? What were some thoughts? I came over to your house one time. I was I was doing some photography for your website, and we wanted to. to you said, "Hey, let me just cook you a meal and come back in half an hour, and we'll get some photos." So you lived across the street from me, and I was uh, I was going back to my house, and you peeled out of the driveway so quick, and your wife came out and looked at me like, what is going on? And then she kind of had this knowing look and she goes, he's going to cook, isn't he? And I said, yeah, he's running to the grocery store. And she said, he loves to feed people. And he is like a kid in a candy store right now. He is so excited to go cook for you. And that, her comment, when she saw you peeling out of the driveway, she knew he's excited because he's going to cook for somebody. And, um, and that just has stuck with me uh, for years ever since you did that. And I'm like, this is a man who, who knows food, loves food, and, and loves blessing people with food. And, uh, and I know about your faith. And, um, and so it's all an extension of, of that. So that's why I was like, man, this is the kind of person I want to talk to about this, about how, how we use whoever we are, whatever skills it is that we have. Um, to, to be a part of the story of God in our lives and of his, his reshaping us. It's funny you say that because so we're doing, my son is having an eighth grade party because he's going to be you know, graduating um, middle school. Mm -hmm. and, and so we're having a bunch of boys over and, and stuff like that. And so my wife's always like, how about maybe you don't cook this time, right? Let's just, you know, I, I need you to help focus on these, you know, these boys that are going to be here. And she's so we we're gonna go. We were gonna go to Chewy's and get some good Mexican food. But what's funny is that they sent out the text, you know, to all the <laughs> mothers and the kids and everything, and we didn't say anything about you know the food. And everyone just kept saying, "What is he cooking?" <laughs> they would have been they would have been really let down. I, and I love Chewy's, but an opportunity to experience. What some is of he your... making? And so my wife's like, 
You know, I think we need to rethink that. You might need to cook something. And I was like, oh, darn. <laughs> <laughs> you, really? were, you were thrilled. Anyways, I love that. I oftentimes go to the afterlife thinking about what, you know, life is hard here on earth. You know, it's, it's meant to be hard. We, we're sinners. It's a fallen world. Things are not easy. And that's why we get stressed out. There's, you know, we, we need to lean on, on Christ and he can help us through those challenging times. I, I think that's what makes it a lot better. But I think about too, like historically, like even just Jesus, how he leveraged food. You know, how he, he knew the power of food and how that could change lives. Just even thinking the greatest example of the, where he turns um, the fish into a basket, you know, and how amazing that must have been. Like, I would have loved to be there and help kindle the fires right after they all got their fish. And like, because they were probably roasting it on the fire, almost like marshmallows or something. And just thinking about that, and I bet it was the best tasting fish ever. And then I often think about when he turned water into wine and like, I, I go, I wonder what age that was and like which vineyard and which grape, you know, I bet it was the best grape and wine that had ever existed. It's probably like the most expensive Napa Valley wine. And so that like is so exciting and cool to like think about that. And then I often think about too, like how can I, how can I serve the kingdom through food? You know, and, and I, you know, I'm, God has blessed me with such a cool opportunity where I get to change the food um, for the seniors. You know, it's like at the last stage of life when really all you have is um, you know, your body sort of not working the way it used to. You have conversation with people. A lot of times these people are just sitting, you know, in their room in their bed and they can't necessarily move, but they get three meals a day. And, and so if I have the opportunity to bless them through making food extraordinary just every little bite rather than slop on the plate that's like awesome to me like knowing that i'm like helping people at the last stage of life sort of connect back to food so so just to explain it that's what that's what you're doing profession you've run restaurants you've done all these various things but but now you work really with senior living facilities is that right and you design yeah menus and kitchens and yeah and actually i'm glad you, let's just talk about that like so my my beginning um, grew up in Washington, was inspired by my parents' Garden of Eden. First job was McDonald's. I always tell people that. And what's cool about McDonald's is at 15, it taught me how, how to um, clean. It, it taught, taught me about time management. They taught us how to wear a uniform correctly. In fact, they were second to the military with their uniform standards. So to get that at a young age, and even though it was burgers and stuff, I created a lot of efficiencies and would learned how to sweep and clean. And so then I, then I got into pizzerias and really started to understand how things cook in an oven, right? And like cooking on some of these Italian stone ovens and learning like, oh, wow, you don't have to, it could be like we can make a calzone or a stromboli or I can roast chicken in here. And like, so wait, wait, wait. This is when you're like a teenager. Uh -huh. So most kids get a job at a pizza joint and they're just like, I just want my paycheck at the end of the day to stick the pizza in the oven. And you're sitting here analyzing mm -hmm. what's going on with the food. How yeah. is the heat changing the properties of this? That's where your mind is That's going. My, yeah, that is where my mind was going. That's interesting. <laughs> and so that's when you know, was, I went, met my wife and she was like, you really should go to culinary school. So... I drew, I just went full force into it. And so then after that, I got involved in all kinds of restaurants in Seattle from steakhouses um, to high-end hotels. I, I was a Google chef for four years while it was growing there in the backyard of Microsoft. And then got involved in senior living and recognized that it's an industry that desperately needs chefs and better food and better menus and nutrition and so I've sort of just flourished from that, from, from moving to Texas to you helped me with a consulting company. You helped develop my website, and that's where those wonderful pictures were that you took of the food last time. And so, you know, because of that, you were, I was able to experience a lot of blessing and, and job opportunities that I would have never had. I didn't know that I would be passionate or become a great cook. I think I just do it so much that... 
I'm like, I've, I can find passion and creativity in this and you just, it's there. You just kind of have to do it. And then it just forms, it forms right in your mind. Like, wow. Sometimes I think it's not me coming up with it, that it's actually God that inspires us and, and has the idea. Cause it happens all the time where I may, like when I was in a kitchen and maybe I'd be stressed out about something and I need to like do something fast with food or create a meal. And I, I would just like lean on God, like, Hey, get me through this next five minutes. Like, you know, like we've got a really, like sometimes Bill Gates would come in, like some high end people would come into the restaurants and I would need a burst of creativity and inspiration to get through like a rush, like where it's like really busy and you know, you're reading like 50 tickets and you just need the innovation and creativity to push through that moment, you know, and he would like, and, and then I would re recognize like, if I didn't ask for help on that, I wonder what would have happened. Like it might've been a train wreck. <laughs> um, but I think that I oftentimes do that. Like I'm, I'll be, when I'm cooking, I'm like, um, I lean on God on the simplest things like, Lord, I've got to make food for six people here and I don't want to go to the store and I need some help about being creative and innovative. And then I'll just kind of, I'll see something and go, oh yeah, I could make, I could cook that or roast that and do this. And then, oh, there's some nuts in there. I could make a cool like macadamia nut butter to go over that fish. And so I, I oftentimes think that God gives us those inspirations and the creativity that, and he designed us. Like, you know what I mean? And so, like, it's all there. Like, you just got to tap into it. Well, and we're, we're made in the image of God. And because God creates, we, we create. I mean, that's just, that's just what it means in my mind, you know, to, to be created in His image. That's why we're creative. Uh, because God is the original author of all, all creativity, right? It absolutely, absolutely comes from Him. It all comes from, all of our creativity comes from Him because He's the, the primary creator. We get to be like God. Um, when we create, and I think you feel his pleasure. Yeah, <clears throat> it's like in the movie *Chariots of Fire*. I um, watched that recently. Oh yeah, well, when Eric Little says, um, "God made me for a purpose, but He also made me fast, and when I run, I feel His pleasure." Hmm. And I think for you, when it's, you cook, yeah, that's exactly when it. you cook, you feel His pleasure. God made you to be creative, and this is this is your expression of that creativity. I, I imagine if you were to walk into any pantry. You'd be excited if you came over to my yeah. house right now because because like okay what do I get to do with this as bare and awful as my pantry is probably compared to yours you would probably look at it then you say okay we've got a good challenge here what can we do with this and how how do I make something incredible happen it's just so true like actually that's one of my favorite things like we used to I used to love doing dinner parties mm -hmm. we would be invited over and I would it was always hard for people but sometimes I would get them to do it. <laughs> Do not buy anything. We're going to make an incredible meal out of your freezer and your canned dry storage. I've done it a couple times, and it's so fun. Like, I don't know what I'm walking into, and like, just to go in <laughs> or make it happen. And as long as they have some protein, and we got stuff in there, I mean, you can make, I mean, you can make, you can take Cheerios, right, and pulverize them in a blender and make a crust on top of fish or pork. Like there's, you know, you can make breading out of anything. <laughs> <laughs> so what, so we talked a lot about what, what do you like about food? Oh man, I was just thinking what a, what a blessing good food is. Um, you know, God, um, we can pray to God. We can ask him for, for sustenance and he provides for us what we need. And then every now and then he provides beyond what we need. And we don't need amazing tasting food. So every time I have a good meal, I'm just reminded this is evidence of God's goodness and His blessing mm. that we get to enjoy some really, really good yeah. food. Yeah, that's so true. And it's, kind of, it's amazing too, like when I think of like the Garden of Eden and like what fruits and like every fruit and vegetable that we are eating right now was growing in that garden in some capacity, right? It might have morphed into something else you know but it like when i think of that beginning stage and god creating that and that flavor like amazing and like how well, much effort that took and it's interesting too you look at that garden and then at jesus resurrection um the gospel of john says that he was initially mistaken for the gardener and i don't know if that's literal because none of the other gospels recorded or if john was making a connection to the garden is being restored 
And then you see in Revelation, uh, this picture at the very end of, of Revelation of this river. For, to begin with, you have a city that has a river running through it, which is bizarre. Cities were built on the tops of mountains so that you could defend them. And it was always a challenge. How do I get down from the city to get my water? And so this picture in Revelation of a city with a river running right through the middle of it, the idea is it's safe. You can build your city right on the water and God's gonna provide for it. And then it says that the fruit trees are growing all along the banks and they're providing fruit 12 months out of the year. They're not even like seasonal fruit trees. Like, again, it's this picture of God's provision that you've got everything you can want. We don't even need sunlight. The glory of God is shining so brightly here. We don't even need sunlight. We have everything. We have safety. We have provision. We have food. We have light. Everything is taken care of in God's heavenly kingdom. And so you see this restoration of the Garden of Eden. And so you see this theme throughout Scripture. It's an incredible um, image that runs That's throughout amazing. all of Scripture from beginning to end. So when you're talking about growing up in Seattle, surrounded by these berries that you just go out and pick, and uh, 40 different types of yeah, fruit trees. Yeah. I mean, and, and you said it feels like the Garden of Eden. And so uh, I love that for you, you, you grew up surrounded by provision and beauty. Yeah. And uh, have continued to, I mean, that shaped who you are, that shaped who you've become, that shaped uh, what you do now. Um, you know, if you if you grew up in Milwaukee, you'd probably be brewing micro beers. Who knows? But uh, <laughs> but, <cheese> curds. <laughs> <laughs> but you grew but you grew up yeah. there, and because that was your palate to work with, that that shaped everything who you are now as a as a Christian man and as, as someone who is who is creative with food. Uh, because you were surrounded by all that. And I just think it's it's a beautiful thing to see what God has done in you and does through you and, and your love for for serving people, the excitement that you get. You know, it's just such an extension of who you are and how you spread the love of God. Absolutely. I think I think it's the coolest thing. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. And thanks for painting it in that that it's funny how different perspectives can give you different insights and like for you to say speak that to me is 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 really uh, is cool. It's like God's reminder of, of hey, this is what I've gifted you with, and you've, you, you know, through the creativity and innovation, it's come to life. Well, I will um, finish up this last little, dude. This was it was good, right? I'm getting some heat right now, and it's wonderful. It's not too much. <laughs> yeah, I don't like a ton. Right I don't like stuff that's gonna make my eyes water, but it's like, ma'am, that's perfect. That's from oh. the, that fresh cayenne. Partly because the food was good, but the conversation was so good. It this is probably cool. the best salad I've ever had. So. Yeah, I agree. It was a great time and session and made me re- re- th- think about things, you know, differently too. Thanks for being on the podcast. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. I hope others enjoy it. I think they will. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Next week, I'm going to sit down with a friend of mine who used to be a clown with the greatest show on earth. That's right, Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus. He went to the Clown College, uh, got to spend a year riding the train from town to town being a clown. And that has forever shaped him and his story uh, and even impacted what he does now. He's hilarious. I absolutely love Steve Hogue. It's going to be a great time. So I hope you'll join me on the podcast again next week. The story that writes us is part of the adult discipleship ministry at Custer Road United Methodist Church in Plano, Texas. If you're in the area, We'd love to have you drop by. You can go to crumc.org to get all the details on that. And you can always go to thestorythatwritesus.com for show notes and photographs of whatever it is we're talking about that day. Thanks for listening.